In this video, I want to talk about how to interact with an API. So API just stands for Application Programming Interface, and it is a structured way for two pieces of software to communicate back and forth. In this case, we're going to have our JavaScript interacting with the Polka API. And the way that we communicate back and forth is by um, sending a HTTP request and getting a response back. So essentially, we our JavaScript code is going to have to send a request to this URL. And what the Polka API returns back to us is this structured data. Um, specifically, this is called JSON, or JavaScript Object no Notation. And it is just essentially a JavaScript object. So we're going to learn how to do this in JavaScript and why this matters is because we're trying to move towards being able to bring databases into our projects, which means that we're going to have to deal with an API. We're going to have to have our code talk to um, a database to put information into the database and take information out of that database. So before we get there, we're going to cover how to do this generally with an API and then we will bring in the database to be able to apply these same concepts um, with databases. So the plan for what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about functions again, and we're going to introduce promises. So functions we've talked about, those are reusable chunks of code, and they are the building blocks that allow us to use promises, which are the way that we can deal with code that is asynchronous. So the idea here, if we can simulate this, I'm going to open up my developer tools and go to the network tab. Uh, in the network tab, you can simulate the speed of your connection. So I'm going to turn my speed down. And then I'm going to request this page again. So I'm going to refresh. And we can see it's hanging for a couple seconds. And then this returns. And we can see how long it took here. So we got a couple seconds before we actually got this data back from the server. So what that looks like is you know, our JS code here made a request. This would be an HTTP request to that Pokemon API. And then some amount of time later, it got a response in JSON. And this whole thing took time to run. So pretend that's a little clock. Um, so the problem that we're trying to deal with here is that if our code uh, ran in, in a synchronous paradigm where we made this request and everything waited until we got a response back, that would mean that our whole application would lock up for like two seconds while this whole thing is running, which means you couldn't do anything on the page. So imagine using any application where like doing something in the application just causes the application to freeze for two seconds. That would be horrible. So what we need to learn how to do is use promises to write our code in an asynchronous way so that we can fire off this request, our browser can keep running um, normally, so other JavaScript can execute, and then when the response comes back, we can go ahead and do whatever we want to do with that response. So we're not going to hang, we're not going to pause the application for two seconds while this cycle is running. We are going to fire off a request and schedule some code to run in the future when the response comes back. So that's the high level preview. We, we've got to review functions. We've got to learn about promises before we can do this talking to the API. So we're going to open up a new project in VS Code and we're going to tackle functions first. One note before I leave the browser is that in a previous video, I talked about installing this JSON formatter Chrome extension, um, which is this one, JSON formatter. So this will, when you load a page in your browser that gives you back JSON that looks like this, it will parse it and make it navigatable and make it pretty. I highly recommend you have that installed when you're doing any work with uh, APIs so that you can see nicely formatted code, uh, nicely form formatted JSON in your browser. 
Okay, so I have some starter files for this project and you can download these and use that as your starting point. So I'm going to open this in Visual Studio Code. We'll do a quick tour of what's in there and then we'll dive into functions. So inside of index.html, there is just a template with a, a main section that's empty where we can inject some content. There is an empty JS file that is linked in here using our script tag of type module to make sure that um, the module import export syntax is enabled for our script, among other things. And then there is a CSS file that is linked here that just does some basic styling, brings in a different font, centers that main container, and uh, sets up images to render in a pixelated way. So we're going to have some low resolution images that we're going to want to blow up. Um, and this will make sure that those get rendered using nearest neighbor scaling or, or basically a pixelated scaling as opposed to trying to smooth things over and blurring all the pixels. So that's all we got set up in here. So what I want to do to kick things off is just review functions because if we don't have really solid foundation in knowing what a function is, then promises are not going to make sense and dealing with an API is not going to make any sense. So let's create a function called greet here and we'll pass in a first name and what this function can do is uh, create a message that greets using that first name and prints it out to the console. So we could create a message here, which is going to be a string, and we'll say something like welcome, and then we're going to put that first name variable in here, and save it. So this is string interpolation, where uh, we're using a template string, which is denoted with the back ticks which is um, the same key on your keyboard where you type in tilde. So here we're, we're typing the string and then the dollar sign curly brackets allows us to inject JavaScript into that string. And once we've got that string, we can say print it out to the console. So this is dormant code. This code does not do anything until we invoke it. So this is the function definition. And this is the function invocation. Where we take the identifier, what we named that function here, uh, greet, and we have parentheses to indicate that we are trying to run this function and then we have to fill in any parameters with specific values. So we could greet Mike, and um, since this is a regular JavaScript project without, it's not set up with create react app, we've got to use our go live extension to run this project. So make sure you have the go live extension installed, pop that open in your browser. And you want to make sure that you have your console window open because that is where all of this is printing out. So it should be in your developer tools. And we can see that message printing out from index.js line four. So we can call this function multiple times with different values. So we could welcome Coraline and Mike. And this chunk of code has been set up so that this will run for both Mike and Coraline, and the, the unique thing is that we're passing in specific information for this first name parameter. Let's actually take a minute and um, whiteboard this out. So I'm going to grab a screenshot. Whoops, let's try that again. Grab a screenshot of our greet function. Copy this, bring it over to the whiteboard. And let's label these parts. So this here is our identifier. 
it is the way that we it's our name for our function it's the way that we're able to refer to this function this is called a parameter which is an input to the function then the opening and closing curly brackets here these denote what is the function body so this is the code that it runs when we call this function so all of this is the function definition and then greet this is the function invocation and what happens here is that this um, which is called an argument gets filled in to our first name parameter and then this code runs so when you think about what's happening here greet uh, when this method is invoked we, we've got the name of the identifier open and closing curly brackets whatever we put or open and closing parentheses whatever we put in the parentheses that gets filled into the matching parameter and then the code runs so first name you can picture in your head is equal to Mike and then this code runs so function it's a um, reusable chunk of code and the fact that we can specify these parameters allow us to make this code um, more general purpose because we can reuse this code in multiple contexts by passing in different names uh, to this function. So let's flip back. Uh, let's see, here we go. And let's create another function here. So we'll do something goofy like welcome secret agent. And we can have multiple parameters. So here we can specify as many parameters as we want uh, within reason, like you probably don't want more than five, but you can have plenty here. They're separated by commas. And then we could say have a different message and do something like the names, last name, first name, last name. So it should say something like <laughs> the name's Bond, James Bond, or whatever we put in for first name, last name. And we could print this out to the console. So welcome secret agent, try it with James Bond. And the parameters here, uh, this corresponds, this argument, James, corresponds to the first parameter. And this argument, Bond, corresponds to the second parameter here. So if we run this in our browser and check it out, we can see the names Bond, James Bond. And of course, because this is a reusable chunk of code, we can invoke it multiple times with different parameters. So we could do sponge Bob. Ooh, typing is tough today. Square pants. The name's SquarePants, SpongeBob SquarePants. So again, reusable chunk of code. We're able to alter how this code runs, what it actually does by specifying different arguments here. So let me add a comment to what we did. Uh, functions can have as many parameters as you want. And one thing that's useful to point out is what happens if we forget to put one of these, um, we forget to specify a value for one of these parameters. So if I just tried to do this for Mike without specifying a last name, and we check it out in the browser, we can see names undefined, Mike undefined. So if you don't pass in a value for one of these parameters, it ends up being undefined which in this case does something unexpected by printing out the word undefined here, but could potentially crash your program or give you a, um, um, a runtime error because you tried to do something with an undefined object that you can't do. So that's good to keep in mind. Let's create another function. So we're gonna create an add function. And let's say we're, we're trying to average three numbers. So we want to be able to find the sum of three numbers. 
So we can create three parameters here. And then inside of our function, we can go ahead and calculate num1 plus num2 plus num3. We're just doing math, adding those together. And then the thing that we want to be able to do is access this sum variable from outside of the function to be able to do something with it. So right now, if I, I called add and I, I specify like 10, 20, 10, um, these numbers go into these parameters. So these arguments get filled in for those parameters. And we calculate the sum, but I kind of, I want to be able to access the sum now to be able to do something with it. So to be able to like divide it by three to get the average. But I can't do that here. If I try to access the sum, like console.log sum, and run it, I get an error that sum is not defined. So this is where the idea of scope comes in, in that um, this variable is defined within this code block, which means that it's scoped to this code block. So I can't access this sum variable outside of that code block here. So the way that we can return information from a function is to use a return statement. So if I return the sum, that means when we run this line of code, it turns into whatever the value the sum is. So this would turn into 10 plus 20 plus 10, which would be 40. So now I could capture that. Let's call it a variable called result here and print that out to the console. And we can see 40 gets printed out. So we're able to take some local variable from inside of this function, the sum, and kind of return it so that whoever invoked that function, which ran down here, can use that. So here we've got the result stored. And if we wanted to calculate the average, we could say the result divided by 3 and print that out to the console. And we can see the average is 13.33333 um, with a 4 at the end. So the return statement actually does two things. One, it stops this function from running. Um, so if I have another line of code down here, like console.log, does this run? We can see that it's uh, in VS Code being grayed out because this function has returned, which means this code can never execute. Return essentially stops the function from running and takes whatever we specify and gives it back to wherever that, has been, that function has been invoked. So here, let's just double check, sanity check, go to the browser. We can't see anywhere where that message is printing out. Does this run? So return both stops the function from executing and gives you the ability to share a value back to whoever invoked that function, which happens here. So I've harped on the debugger before, and it's really helpful when you're trying to understand how code works. So let's use it. And there are two ways that we can do this. We can either put this line debugger wherever we want a breakpoint to show up in our code, and this will kick us over to the debugger in Chrome DevTools, or we can um, put a breakpoint into our code in the sources tab, or we could install the VS code extension and drop a breakpoint here and run our um, uh, Chrome extension uh, debugger through Visual Studio and get the breakpoint showing up. So I'm going to just go with this version, which is pretty easy. It has already popped open the debugger here now that my code has refreshed, which means that I can step through and watch what happens. So right now, result is undefined. And if I hit F11 to step into, um, we can see that the right-hand side of this executes first. So it, it's going to go to this add function, and it's going to pass in 10, 20, 10. And if I now step in F11, I can hover over these parameters and see that they were filled in with 10, 20, 10. And now this line of code is going to execute. So we can see that sum is currently undefined because it's working on the right-hand side of this equation. And if I hit F11, we can see that now um, sum is 40. 
if I look at my result, my result is currently undefined still, uh, but if I hit F11 so that this return runs, we can see that now the return is filled in with whatever was calculated there. In this case, it was 40. We can calculate our average by doing result divided by three, and then this will print out to our console, which if I flip over, now that I've hit F11 to let that run, we can see print out. So if you're confused about what a function does or how your code is running, I highly, highly encourage you to use the debugger to explore and watch the code execute line by line. So I'm going to resume and get rid of this debugger line. So I'm going to add a comment here. Functions can return information back to whoever invoked them. And the return is optional. You don't have to return from a function, um, but you can. And one thing here uh, that can trip people up when they're learning about functions for the first time is you're like, well, we just printed out to the console. Why wouldn't we just put that line of code in here and not return anything? And so the, the reason why you do that is you want to break your functions into modular pieces and uh, we don't want to tie them to console logging. So here, if we put the console log into this function, that would mean if we wanted to add three numbers and create an alert, uh, we couldn't do that with this function. But if I write my function so that they return values like this, then it's up to me to decide where I want to put that. So I could console log it, I could also alert it, and I could throw it onto the page using, um, since we're in a JavaScript file and not in React, we could use inner HTML to put this on the page. Let's run it. So we can see it's showing up in an alert now and also still showing up in our console. So what I want to show you now is arrow functions, which we've used a ton, but I want to review them. So these are going to be arrow functions. So we're going to recreate this function here with an arrow function, and I'm going to do it in two ways. So add with arrow is equal to num1, num2, num3, and then create this fat arrow, which is equals greater than sign, curly brackets, and then I can type the same thing, const sum equals num1 plus num2 plus num3, return sum. So an arrow function is an alternate syntax for expressing this. We can see where the, the pieces sort of match. So we've got an identifier here called add. Here's our identifier here, add with arrow. We have three parameters listed in parentheses. These are our three parameters listed in parentheses. We have in the arrow function this alternate syntax that sort of indicates that these three parameters go into this code block, uh, which is the same structure we have here with the three parameters and then the code block uh, right after it. And then our code is inside the function here inside of this code block. So this is the body and it can have a return statement at the end of it. So add with arrow is going to do the same thing as add. So I could create another result here, add with arrow. And console.log, the sum is result2. So the sum is 57. So this still functions the same. It still adds those three numbers together. There are some technical differences between how an arrow function and a function works. And, um, you know, functions, what? happens when you declare a function like this, it gets hoisted to the top of the scope. Don't worry if you don't know what that means. Um, and also in a function, uh, this means something different than this inside of an arrow function. And this is a keyword. Again, don't worry if you don't know what those mean, but for programmers that are following along, um, those are things to keep in mind. So far, you're, you might look at these and think, well, 
they look basically the same. Maybe this is a little bit more typing. And so what I want to show you is some of why arrow functions are, are popular is because they are a short, they can be a shorter syntax. So let me comment this out. So I'm selecting it all, hitting control forward slash, and I can create a new one, add with arrow. And this does the same thing as this. So if I check out my console, I should still see 57 printout. Sum is 57. But this is a much sh shorter syntax. I've been able to express this function in a single line of code. So we still have our three parameters, and we still have uh, what's called the fat arrow. And then on the other side of the equation, if you just have a single line of code, you can have an expression here, and this is considered an implicit return. So you can imagine that it's as if we had curly brackets around this and said return to indicate that the result of these three numbers being added together is being returned. But with an arrow function, when you only have a single line and no curly brackets, this is implicitly a return. So you can omit some of that syntax and get a much shorter line of code. And some people, once you get used to the syntax, will find this more readable in that you know it looks like we're basically taking these three parameters and transforming it into num1 plus num2 plus num3. So this arrow functions, this can be a more concise, whoops, concise syntax for functions. So anything that you write with arrow functions, you can write with regular functions, um, but you will find arrow functions to be really common, especially as we're dealing with promises uh, later in the video. Okay, so let me show you an example using arrow functions to do something. Like let's say we have in, our, in a game we have the enemy attacks They've got three attacks and, and they, they maybe have like different powers. Like the first one is a weak attack, the next one's a lot stronger, the next one's a bit stronger. And um, the enemy drinks a potion, we need to double all of these values in our game. So we could do this in one of two ways. We could create a function called double, which takes in a number and returns the number times two. And then we can bring our map function back in, which, which we've used before. So I could say the doubled attacks is equal to enemy attacks dot map and pass in that double function. So remember, map will take a function and apply it to each element in that array to transform it into a new array. So if I print out my doubled attacks, and look at it in the browser, we can see 20, 40, 50. So each of those got doubled and turned into a new array. So this is one way to write this code using our functions uh, declared with the regular function syntax. Another way that we could write this, if I comment out doubled attacks, and let's do doubled attacks, we can say enemy attacks.map, and we can put an arrow function directly in here. So remember, our arrow function is this syntax where we've got parentheses, fat arrow, curly brackets, and we can do something that looks like this implicit return where we take in the number and say it is transformed into number times two. So this expresses the same thing as doing this map with our separate function, but we're just using an arrow function with an explicit return here. So if I save it, check it out, same thing runs in the browser, and this is a, a much terser, a much more concise syntax for expressing what we did here, because we can do all of that in a single line. Okay, so we've covered functions, 
uh, we, we talked about function definitions, function invocation, parameters, returning things, and built our way up to understanding this really concise syntax for arrow functions with implicit returns. So what I would recommend you do is just pause the video before, come, uh, for, before we go to the next thing and um, practice those things. Try making a couple functions in your, your project to make sure that you understand this syntax. Because the next thing we're going to talk about is promises, which we're going to really highly use this arrow function syntax and build our way up to talking to an API. OK, so what I'm going to do, let's pull up some documentation here. The MDN documentation is good for promises. So you can search MDN promise and end up at a page here that describes what a promise is. So in JavaScript, a promise is an object that represents the eventual completion or failure of an asynchronous operation and its resulting value. Um, so this is the technical page, and it also says, you know, here's this page on using promises, which is maybe where you want to start first for understanding promises. But let's flip back to this first page here. So um, a promise is sort of a proxy for a value um, that we don't yet know when the promise is created. So we're basically saying, here's this object. It wraps the result of some asynchronous action. So this asynchronous action is something that usually takes time, like talking to a server. And we don't know whether it's going to be successful or not. So we start this promise um, and hope that it'll work. And uh, we can set up logic to run when the result comes back. And we can set up logic to run when there's an error. So uh, a promise is, is always in one of three states. It's either pending, fulfilled, or rejected. So when we start a promise, it's in that pending state. It's talking to the server, it's waiting for some response, or it's you know talking to some other API waiting for a response. And we don't yet know whether it was successful or unsuccessful. And if it is successful, it moves into this fulfilled state where our code that we've said should run when we enter a fulfilled state runs. So this is, we, we've got something back, it's successful. We got our response back from the Pokemon API, for example. So it could go from pending to fulfilled, or it could go from pending to rejected, which means that something went wrong. We asked for the wrong URL, the server crashed, um, and we can set up code to run when that promise is rejected. And you can see a little kind of state diagram here for how promises work. And let's make a simplified version in our whiteboard. So let me pull these up side by side. We can zoom down. So our promise is going to be this proxy around some kind of value. So we're hoping that it will talk to the server and we'll get JSON back, but we might get an error. So when we create a promise, it starts out in this pending state. And it is going to end up either being fulfilled and there's a successful result or it is going to be rejected. So fulfilled or rejected. And if it's fulfilled, we, we will get back from that server, you know, some sort of successful response. Um, or if it's rejected, we will get some kind of error. And when we think about these two states, uh, we often call these settled. So both of these, we would consider that the promise has finished, it's been settled, and it's either fulfilled or it's rejected. So you know, here we would maybe get data from API. That might be an example of what happens here. And rejected, you know, some error. in connecting to the API. And what this diagram is showing you is that you can actually chain things. So your promise, you can set up something to run when the promise is fulfilled or rejected. And then you can kind of chain things on from here. So we could say, 
you know, if this was fulfilled, we're going to set up another promise to do something else. And we could have fulfilled and rejected there. And you can keep sort of spidering out and setting up a chain of things to run asynchronously with promises. So if we look at our documentation and scroll down, we can see some examples of promises. So here is a promise. Um, we'll, we'll talk about what this is, but this is the sort of logic of the promise. So a new promise is created, and then we set up that this should run after that, and then this function should run after that, and then this function should run after that. And we can have some function down here to catch any errors um, that occurred in this chain. Okay, so let's let's actually flip over to code and make a really simple promise to start, and then we'll be able to use a promise to talk to an API. So I think to make this a little bit cleaner, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select all of this with Control A and then Control X to cut it, and I'm going to put it into a functions demo.js file so that we have it for reference later. And if we wanted it to run, we could go ahead and import functions demo.js uh, and see that it's still running in the browser, but I can now comment that out so that it is no longer clogging up our console. So this is no longer running if we don't import it. And let's do, this will be our demo promise. And this is going to be kind of a weird thing to, to demo outside of the context of talking to an API. But what we're going to do is set up a promise. It'll generate a random number. So some of the time it will work. Um, it will resolve successfully. And then some of the time we'll make it fail. You know, if we get a specific number, we'll make the promise fail so that we can see the chain of how things work. So we're going to create a promise here. So this is this syntax for new promise with parentheses that is instantiating a new promise. It's giving us a new promise object. And the thing that we have to fill in here is the logic of that promise. So we're going to use an arrow function. So again, that's the parentheses, fat arrow, curly brackets. And a promise has two parameters. It has a resolve function and a reject function. So with this promise, inside of this function, if we call resolve, that means that we end up uh, let's grab that whiteboard. If we call resolve, we end up going through this fulfilled path and we can return some information. And if we call reject, we go down this reject path and the promise is ending with an error. So the logic in here, uh, resolve or reject, determines you know how the promise ends up moving from its pending state to either... Uh, of the settled state, fulfilled or rejected. So what I'm going to do is create a timeout. And we, we've seen timeout before. The idea with timeout is that if you put a function in here and then you specify a time, like 1000, we are saying run this function, run whatever code we put in here, one second in the future. So this is the way that we're kind of simulating some asynchronous logic. We're saying, we've got a new promise, it's going to wait a second, and then it's going to do something. It's either going to resolve or reject. So I'm going to create a random number. Um, so math.random with a lowercase r. This is going to give us a number between 0 and 1. And uh, 0 is a possible value, but uh, 1 is not going to be a possible value, and we can look this up in the MDN documentation. So if you search MDN random, uh, you get a documentation. So it, it's telling us it's a floating point number, it's a pseudo-random number between 0 and 1, 
where one, uh, zero is inclusive and one is exclusive, meaning that we, you can never get one out of this random number generator. So I'm just gonna do something here to get a random number between one and three. So if I multiply this by three, I'm gonna get a random number between zero and three with um, three never being possible. And then math.floor, whoops, this is going to take our random number and turn it into an integer. If I hover over math.floor, it gives us an integer that is um, less than or equal to whatever you give it. So if you give it 3.5, it gives you three. If you give it 2.2, .2, it's gonna give you um, two. So this equation together is gonna give us a random number that is either going to be zero, one, or two. And we're gonna, this promise, let's say, if the random number is not one, we're gonna resolve. So this is going to successfully complete the promise. Otherwise, we've got a one, we're gonna reject and say, um, like something silly like the number was the evil number one. And when we resolve, we can pass back some information so we could you know, give that random number back. So in the case that we resolve, grab our whiteboard, we're fulfilling that promise and we're settling and then we can return some information. So when we talk to an API, that would be we're getting the response back from the API. In this case, when we resolve, we're just giving back a random number. And then the reject here, we're seeing um, our reject, we're just passing back this string that is the error message that the number was the evil number one. So that's what happens for this path for our promise. So this is the creation of the promise. If I were to go into my browser, nothing is, new is going to happen in our console. Whoops, open up the developer tools, nothing new in the console here. Because what we're missing is setting up the logic to run based on whether this promise resolves or rejects. So here I'm gonna say p.then to indicate that this should run, whatever we put in the parentheses here, should run when the promise resolves. Promise successful generated a num. So this promise, when it uh, runs and we end up in this resolve, what's happening is this random number gets given to our function that we defined here and we can do something with it. So if this were a result from an API, we could kind of parse the data from the API and put it on the page. Here we're just getting uh, that number and printing it out to the console. So if I refresh the page, we're gonna see, whoops, uh, not P, this should be the word promise. So I'm, I'm just looking and seeing an error here that's telling me it's on line 14 where I used P instead of promise. So I'm referring to my promise and I'm calling, uh, since promise is an object, it has data and it has methods. Um, I'm calling the then method and giving it this function, you know, run this when you resolve. And if I check it out in the browser and refresh it a couple of times, we can see that it waits for a second and then the promise resolved and gives us back the random number that it generated. So it waited a second because of this timeout and then ended up generating a random number that resolved and passed back that random number to us. Let me turn down this to maybe um, 500 milliseconds instead of a full second. So we're seeing zero, zero, two, two, zero. 
and eventually we're getting an error as I keep refreshing. So what we need to do, this is our program crashing that there's an uncaught error um, and there's our error message. What we wanna do is actually gracefully handle that. So if you say promise.then, you are chaining some logic to run when this resolves. If we do promise.catch, we can pass in another function um, and we can say whatever was passed in to that reject function, here this string, we're gonna get it as a parameter here. And then we can print out console.log error and pass in that message. So for both of these we're making that we're using that terse arrow function syntax where we can omit the curly brackets. So we're getting an error. It is being piped to the console and printed out with this prefix of error. So if I run this a couple of times, we should see, there we go. We've got our error. Um, the number was the evil number one being printed out because we have caught that error from our promise. Something else that we can do with our promises is promises have a finally um, method where we can add some logic to run after the then or after the catch. So finally, if we look at our diagram here, when you enter the settled state, either the then, the fulfilled logic will run, or the catch, the error logic will run, and then finally we'll run after those. So we can set up an arrow function. Finally doesn't get any information passed into it. It is just something that we can run after um, our then or our catch. So here, console.log promise was either fulfilled or rejected. So we're going to see either the then printout and then our finally logic printout, or we're going to see the catch printout and our finally logic printout. So if I save this, check it out in the browser again, we can see promise was successful and then afterwards promise was either fulfilled or rejected. If I refresh it a few more times, getting two a lot here. Ah, there we go. We got the error and then promise was fulfilled or rejected, printed out. So this syntax that you're seeing here um, is one way to write your logic for your promise where you create that promise. Um, so you get a new promise object and then you can use the methods that live within that promise object to attach logic. The other way that you could see this, so what I'm gonna do is I'll leave that here for reference. I'm gonna comment it out. I'm gonna paste this down here. You can run something called chaining where instead of storing this in a variable, I can just say new promise. So this gives me a promise and get rid of the word promise here and get rid of my semicolons. This structure is chaining where we have a promise. We call dot dot then on that promise, which returns the promise back to us. So we can call dot catch on that, which returns the promise back to us. And we can call dot finally. So this way of setting up your promise allows you to chain all of these method calls in sequence, which is what we saw in that documentation page on uh, using promises here. Uh, so we've got a new promise and then we can chain dot then dot then dot then dot catch on to that promise. So I'm gonna document this and call this the chaining demo of a promise. So this syntax is, the, there's a lot going on here. This can be hard for the first time, but a, just to sort of reemphasize the concept before we move on to the using the API and using promises with the API, promise is an object. So it has data and it has methods and we can call dot then to add a function to run when that promise is fulfilled. 
and we can call dot catch on that promise to add some logic to run when the promise is rejected and then we can call dot finally down here to run some logic after either of these so a promise it's a way for us to deal with asynchronous logic and run things based on how that asynchronous logic resolves so it'll either be successful or it will generate an error and will either be in this fulfilled or rejected state So what I'm going to do is move this to a new, whoops, did not mean to open File Explorer, <laughs> create a new promise demo, or I guess there's multiple, we'll call it promises demo. Um, I'm going to grab this code, copy it or cut it and paste it into my promises demo. And we can import it to make sure that it still works import promises demo.js and I can see in my browser you know that's still running but if I comment it out no longer running and now we have enough to if we look back at our whiteboard our initial plan was to learn functions and promises so that we could talk to the Pokemon API so we're there we're now at the point that we could talk to this API and leverage all of this stuff that we just learned so APIs, application programming interfaces, there are a lot out there and there are a lot that are set up as these servers that will respond to URLs and give you back data. Each service is going to have a different way that you use it. There are some general conventions for making APIs, but um, each one is made by a different person so or a different team. And so there's usually some documentation that goes along with it. So anytime you're working with an API, you should definitely check out the documentation to understand how you use uh, that API. What is the data that comes back from that API? How is it structured? How do I authenticate with the API to be able to pull information from it? I'm using this Poke API because it um, has no authentication process. Anyone is able to send a request to this URL and get back the data uh, for ditto or whatever Pokemon we want to put in. Some APIs will require you to have a key, which is essentially like your password to get access to the API. And you will sometimes put that key into the URL bar. So it'll, you know, look something like this with putting your key into the request that you're sending. Sometimes the key doesn't go in the URL, but goes in what are called the headers. Um, and then there are other ones where you have to go through a much more involved process to authenticate that you are allowed to have access to the API. So just know that those are possibilities. If you go off exploring other APIs, you have to look into how the authentication process works. But I like this one a lot because it's really easy for us to demo. We, we don't need any authentication. And then if we look through the documentation, we can see that there are um, some Informa there's some general information here about uh, fair use and libraries that have been built to talk to this API. And then there are documentation pages for the different what are called endpoints of the API. So if I click on Pokemon and scroll down, um, we can see that there are a lot of different endpoints here. So this we can ask for an ability where we specify a Pokemon ability and we get back all of this data about the ability. So here we're, we're seeing the ability is stench and the effect is this Pokemon's damaging move has 10% chance to make the target flinch, blah, 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 blah. Um, so that's one endpoint. And if I look down, we could look at um, Pokemon. So we can go to this URL API v2 Pokemon slash and then we can put an ID or name in here and then get back this information about the Pokemon. So if you went to Pokemon slash Pokemon slash 12 or slash Butterfree, you would get this data back. So Butterfree is 11 tall and is 320 in weight. If we want to know what units or more information about any of these stats, we would come down here and look and see, oh, wait. This is in hectograms, and height is in decimeters. 
So going through this, looking through the Pokemon endpoint, looking through the sample data, looking through the description will tell you uh, what that data is and what it means. So anytime you're using an API, you definitely want to read the documentation closely. The Pokemon API, the, the folks who made it did a great job of describing all of their API and giving you samples. <laughs> you won't always get this from every API um, out there in the world. So we're going to be using this Pokemon endpoint. So you want to keep this URL handy, um, the Poke API docs, and then clicking on Pokemon and going to the Pokemon endpoint. And if I grab this URL, and let's see this load in our browser. So I, I can either go ID12 or Butterfree. So Pokemon slash 12 will give me back Butterfree or uh, type in the name slash Butterfree. And this also loads our Butterfree. So the next piece of the puzzle that we need is you know how do we ask in our javascript for this and get back this data that's where a new piece of the api comes in for the browser called fetch so if you search for fetch you'll end up on the mozilla documentation page and fetch is an interface for fetching resources including across the network um, using this request object, so an HTTP request, um, and you will get a response back. So fetch allows you to have this request and response object, so you can configure the request that you're sending to have all the information that the API needs, and then the response object is what you get back, which tells you, you know, what did you get from the server. And if you scroll down, this is the API documentation page for Fetch. And there is a using Fetch documentation page inside of MDN as well, which goes through how you use Fetch. Um, so it's telling us, you know, it's in a JavaScript interface for accessing and manipulating parts of the HTTP pipeline. So that request and response cycle that we saw. And if we scroll down, here's an example where you pass in that URL and then you can see we're, we're seeing some familiar stuff. We, we see then, and we see an arrow function, and we see some things chained together here. So this is returning a promise that is either gonna resolve or reject based on whether that request was successful. And if it was successful, then whatever you put in here is going to run. And when that finishes, you can chain on multiple pieces of logic, so here, um, this is getting the response, that HTTP response. It's getting the JSON version of that response. And then here, this function runs using that data. So if you scroll down, you can see some more examples of how you can use fetch. So this is a more complicated example where instead of just passing in a URL to your fetch, you're passing in a bunch of information to configure the request. So for us, we're only going to need this simple version, but just know out there that if you're interacting with other APIs uh, that require more configuration of that request object, you'll have to dig into this documentation page to be able to configure your fetch um, with those options. So let's flip back. What I'm gonna do is, is grab this URL for Butterfree and go to my JavaScript file. And we are going to have a fetch promise that is equal to doing this fetch. Oops, and this needs to be a string. So we're saying, go get this URL, send an HTTP request to this URL. Um, and the promise wraps up that, because this is an asynchronous action, um, it, it wraps up that logic so that we can run something when something comes back that is successful or when uh, that went, something went wrong and the fetch failed. So if I print this out, I'm just I'm calling fetch whatever this function returns back to me. I want to see in the console log. So if I print out fetch promise and pull up my console here, we can see promise, um, and if I do this really quickly, we can see promise pending, 
And by the time that I expand this, we can actually see that the state is now fulfilled. And this is because uh, it took me a second to expand this and see that the, the promise, uh, see the state of the promise. So let's run some logic on this fetch promise. So I can say fetch promise and use our dot then. And what this first parameter is going to be is the response. So let's just print it out, console.log response. And let's also do a fetch promise dot catch. If there's some error, let's make sure that we print out that error. Console.log error. And whoops, let's make this a template string so that I can put the error message in here. So this goes off and fetches a response. Let me, I'm gonna slow down my network so that we can see this. Uh, so I'm gonna go slow 3G and refresh this. So what happens first is once our JavaScript loads and that fetch, fetch is initiated, we see the pending. And then sometime later, we see this response come back to us. And actually to make this clear, I could print out fetch initiated. This line of code runs before either of these run um, with my slow network setup. So if I refresh the page, we should see our initial printout of the promise and then fetch initiated. And then sometime later that response comes back to us. Okay. And so we've got our fetch, we're getting a response back. And that response, if we look at it, has some information. It, it tells us whether that response was okay. It tells us what the status code was. It tells us what URL we were requesting, and it has the body. And the body is where the um, that JSON is going to be. So we want to parse that body, and we can use that body. The way that uh, this object will, this promise will actually reject is not if we made an invalid URL request here. So like if I put a bunch of gibberish in here. So this URL shouldn't do anything. This should 404 um, in the browser because there's nothing there for, from that server. And let me turn my network back up to full speed. Our promise uh, here didn't reject. We still ended up printing out the response. So we ended up in our then here and if we look, we can see that the OK variable uh, inside of our response is false and the status is 404. So this still is considered a successful fetch. It's just that the server gave back to us information to say that, you know, you asked for something that wasn't there. The way that a promise uh, from our fetch actually rejects is if there is something that prevents that fetch from ever happening. So let me, I'm going to go back to the valid um, request for Butterfree and I go to my network and if I go offline and try refreshing the, oops, well, that's going to be uh, difficult to demo. Um, you're just going to have to take my word for this. So if we were offline, our page loaded and somehow we went offline before the fetch uh, was able to resolve, that's where we would end up catching with this error. So if, if for some reason the, the browser disconnects or you lose your internet connection um, while this fetch is running, that's how you end up getting an error. So this is gonna run as long as you get a response back from the server, and this is gonna run if you weren't even able to connect to that server for some reason. Okay, so let's expand this. We've got, uh, I'm gonna use chaining here. So I'm gonna leave what we've got here with printing out the fetch promise, but I'm gonna use chaining to put these then and catch together on this one um, fetch promise variable that we've got. 
So fetch promise dot then actually returns this fetch promise again. So you're able to chain and say dot catch afterwards. Let's expand this with uh, curly brackets so that we can put multiple lines inside of our error function. Because if we don't have those curly brackets, we can only have a single line in our arrow function. So we saw that that response was an object which has a bunch of information in it. And if I flip back to the browser and go MDN response, we can see the documentation for that response object. So it's got that OK, which tells us whether or not the response was successful. It's got the HTTP status code, um, along with some other information in here. So we can print some of these pieces of information out. So I could console.log and say response OK and print out the response dot OK. Whoops, uh, that's lowercase response dot OK. And let's also print out the status. So console.log response status and put the response dot status in there. So if we check out what's happening, we're getting response OK is true for that URL for Butterfree and response status 200. So the HTTP statuses, you can Google HTTP status codes. And let's see. Uh, let's actually go with this one, yes. Uh, this is a better cheat sheet. So it this tells you, you know, the 200 status codes. These are ways that servers can communicate over HTTP. You know, what happened? Was it a success? Was it that you know you asked for something that lives in a new place, so it's a redirection? Was there something wrong with what the client, what our JavaScript, our browser asked for? Um, so like 404 is an error that says that you asked for something that doesn't exist on the server. Um, 500 are errors related to the server, something like broke on the server, not on the client. So you might get these if something went down on the uh, Pokemon API. These are if we made a bad fetch. And then the 200 ones are like, you know, it's good. You, you got a success. So we can see that we're getting the response status of 200, which if we look, tells us okay. Uh, that request... Uh, um, was good and the response that you're you're getting back is good. So let's make a bad request. We'll request a Pokemon with a gibberish name here. Save it, check it out in the browser. We can see that our response is still printing out, so our then is still running. So the promise was successful. I'm kind of air quoting around that. But we can see that the response is not okay. That Boolean variable is printing out as false and the status is 404, meaning there was nothing there, not found. So what I like to do here in my fetches is if that response was not okay, so this is uh, a, a short way to say, you know, if response was false, response.okay was false, you can say it in this longer form, or you can just use the not operator here to s express if the response was not okay. Let's actually create an error. So we can throw an error and say bad API request. So inside of our then, if we throw an error, we're actually kicking things over to our catch statement. So as soon as the runtime engine that's running this code encounters this error, it stops anything else from running that's below it. So if we had code down here that was supposed to continue to run, uh, it'll stop that from running. It's like a return statement in that way. And it will kick us over, since we're in this promise chain, to our catch here. So now what happens when we get that 404 is that our we're still getting that then starting to run, but then we're getting this error printout that says bad API request. And we can see that there's uh, 
it's printing out error error because uh, this actually when you print it out to a string has that error at the start of it um, error colon so actually we could just remove this and just console.log the error here error bad API request okay so we've got a response let me go back to let's do ditto now in here to no longer get that error we've got a 200 so we're good what we want to do now that we know that the response is okay is actually parse the body um, so if we look at the response object the body is what's called a, a readable stream. Um, so the body is that JSON, you know, it's all of this stuff, um, but it's not in a format yet that we can use. So if you look at the methods on a response object, the uh, you can call dot blob or dot form data or dot JSON to take that response stream and turn it into another format. So here you need to know kind of what the server is giving you. We know that we're getting JSON back. So we want to use this JSON method, which takes the response and um, gives it back to us as a JSON object. So it, it takes the text that it was getting, converts it to a JSON object and gives it back to us. But the key here is that it returns a promise uh, with that JSON result. So this is another asynchronous action so if you were to use this, you would say response.json and then chain on another then um, so that you can run some logic when that promise resolves. This is because uh, the, the reason why this is asynchronous is because that operation could take time. It could be a really big file that needs to be converted to JSON and you don't want your whole application to lock up while that's being parsed. So we've got another step of asynchronousness, uh, asynchronous, async. We've got another step that has some asynchronous logic inside of our code. So one way that we can do that is we could say response.json to get that promise back and then say dot then and run some logic here. But what's more common to do is to return response.json. So this calls that promise, returns it, and what happens with promises is that we can chain them together. So if I have dot then here, the way that this code uh, runs is that our fetch starts. It's in that uh, pending state running, talking to that server, waiting for a response. A response comes back, we print out all this information. If the response was good, we end up down here and we initiate a new promise. So now the browser is gonna you know, hang for a bit here, wait till it has finished parsing that response that we got back from the server and turning it into JSON, and then it will call our next then in this chain. So you can attach a whole lot of thens in sequence um, to run a bunch of promises or a bunch of asynchronous logic uh, in sequence. So let's go ahead, save this and check it out in the browser. So we're seeing our response, then we've got those two things printing out from our response object. And then this next thing is actually the JSON. It's our JavaScript object. It's what we're seeing in the browser we've been able to parse it and um, get a JavaScript object notation representation of it so we could reach in and use some of these things. So let's, let's use some of this. We're going to print it out in the browser. Um, and this is an object. So we're going to use dot notation to access pieces of this object. And there are you know, two things that you should have handy as you're doing this. You, one way to figure out what you want to print out um, or what you want to grab and how to grab it is to look at this in the browser, print this out. The other way is if you go back to the documentation page for Pokemon, it has some sample data here that we can explore. So if we wanted to print out, say, um, here we've got Butterfree, what are Butterfree's types? We can see that types is an array 
and the first thing in that array for Butterfree is an object that has two properties, slot and type. And type is an object that, if you drill down into it, has the name flying. So we're going to have to think carefully about the structure of our object when we go to use dot notation to pull things out from this object. So we'll start with the easy thing. Let's print out the name. So we've got this object. It has a property called name, which has a value of ditto. So here, what we can do is print out the name, or I could grab it into a local variable. I could say the name is equal to this JSON variable, JSON dot name. And then I could console log the Pokemon is name. The Pokemon is ditto. And let's say we wanted to grab the weight here, which is 40. We do the same thing, const weight. We are referring to that object, JSON, and we are using our dot notation to access a property from it. So weight. And this must exactly match in case and in spelling the thing that you see in here or in the documentation page. So it has to exactly match the key name, N-A-M-E, all lowercase, or weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, uh, all lowercase as well. So we could um, modify our statement here to say the Pokemon name weighs and then put in our weight. And it was um, uh, hectograms is the unit that we saw in the documentation. So the Pokemon ditto weighs 40 hectograms. So the next thing that I want to print out is this inside of sprites, we can see that there are a couple of URLs. So for instance, there is a front default, which is this URL. And if I grab it here and go to it in the browser without those quotation marks, there's our little ditto. It's a tiny image. Um, so we want to print that out to the console. So what we need to do is go into our object, get sprites, and then in sprites, get front default. So we need to use our dot notation to go from our JSON object, dot sprites, and then this is an object, sprites is an object, which we can see um, it's got the curly brackets here at the start, and if I expand it, I can see all the properties uh, within that object. So I can see, okay, we're gonna have to say dot sprites, dot front underscore default to actually get this URL back. So I can get my URL and let's call it the front image URL. It is the JSON dot sprites dot front underscore default. And I could print that out as well. I could say console.log check out um, ditto here and print that front image URL. So check out ditto here, and if I click on it, it should take me to um, ditto. There are a lot of things that could go wrong here. You know, if you misspelled sprites and typed sprite, we're going to get an error that is um, being caught here. So it's, it's printing out on index 27. It's getting caught here because we've got an error that is somewhere printing out here. And we can see it's on the error starting on line uh, 23 in index. So this is where the error is. And we can read that message, cannot read property, front default of undefined. So we, we talked to this JSON object and we tried to ask for a property that's not there. So it, it comes back as undefined and then you can't ask for front default of undefined. So as you're working on this, be, be very careful um, 
that you're using the right property names and also make sure that uh, when you run into errors, you read those error messages to try and figure out what's going on in your code. Let's add one more thing to print out. Um, let's look at the types here. So we can see types is an array that has an object in it. So types is an array with one object and that object here has the slot and type properties. And that type, if we nest uh, dive in deeper, has the name of normal. So that's actually what we want to print out. We want to know what is its first type. What is Ditto's first type or whichever Pokemon's first type. So what we have to do is talk to this JSON object. We are going to ask for the types, which gives us back an array. And then we need the zeroth, the first thing in that array. So index zero. We'll need the type from index zero. And then inside of that type object, we're going to need the name. So we could do this in steps. Like we could say the types is equal to json.types and console.log types. So here we can see types. That's an array. It has one thing in it. And that thing is an object with slot and type. So I could print out types dot uh, types zero because types is an array to grab the first thing from that array. So now we just have that slot type. And so now I've got an object where I could say dot type to get this object. So type zero dot type. We can now see we've got normal and we've got the URL to look up more information about that type. And then dot normal here. Uh, whoops, not dot normal, dot uh, name to get normal. So even though this, is, this seems like a crazy syntax, it is just a matter of making sure that you get each step right as you're parsing it. So I've got my types here pulled out into an array and I could say the first type is equal to this types zero dot type dot name. And we could print out ditto's first type is first type. save it, check it out in our browser. We've got the Pokemon Ditto weighs 40 hectograms, hectograms and uh, Ditto's first type is normal. Here's an image of Ditto. All we're doing is stepping through that JSON object to pull out the information that we want to display it in the console. So what I would recommend as you're working through this um, if you run into errors, step it out. So print out each step of this chain that you're trying to do and make sure that you get the right value um, at each step. So you could, if you had made the mistake of doing json.sprite, you could print out json.sprite, you would see that it's undefined and that would give you a clue that like, oh, I messed up something here. And you would look back at your documentation to, to sort of compare what you did versus what the object looks like. So what I want to do just to wrap this up uh, for demo purposes is put some of this into the page and we're not in a react project. We're just doing this in JavaScript to focus on the concepts of promises and functions without needing to um, worry about the react life cycle of things. So we're going to do something that we usually don't do anymore when we make react projects. So I'm going to say we don't do this in react projects, but we want to grab our main element and put the result of that API into the main element. So I'm going to get that main element using our document dot query selector and ask for the main element using an element selector in our string. And then we can say main.innerHTML 
to put some content into the HTML within our main element and use a template string, which allows us to put that content over multiple lines. And we could just drop in an h1 with the name and see that this works. So we've got ditto printing out on the page. We could put in a paragraph that has our information that we were printing out here, like the Pokemon ditto weighs however many hectograms and give us another one and copy what we were printing out to the console here. Ditto's first type is first type. So instead of it printing out on the console, it's now showing up on the page. And we could add an image with an SRC equal to, whoops, um, our front image URL. So this is just what the markup should look like. And we are injecting JavaScript here in between the quotation marks. So front image URL. And we could say that the width of that image should be, say, 400. And so now our image of ditto loads in addition to the data that we got from the API. So we could change this if we wanted to see Butterfree. Butterfree prints out. And these images, even though they're really uh, low resolution because of that CSS rule of images, image rendering pixelated, that is making sure that they show up scaled reserving, uh, um, using nearest neighbor, which allows these pixels to not be smoothed out, but to show up as crisp. Uh, so let's go, I'm going to close these down. Let's look at our index.js. We did a ton here. Uh, so a lot of it was review where we talked about functions and we made sure we understood them. And then we introduced this concept of promises, which allows us to deal with asynchronous logic inside of our code. And the reason why we needed that is so that we could use fetch, which if I hover over fetch, it tells us that it is a function that returns a promise. So fetch initiates that request to the server. And what we saw, uh, let me collapse this down so we can just focus on the concepts. This fetch runs it starts talking to the server, so it initiates that request, and we set up these things to run in sequence when that fetch either is fulfilled or um, errors out. But this line at the bottom on line 41, any code that we put here runs immediately after we initiate the fetch. So even though you think, just from reading top to bottom, that our code, uh, our fetch would start and then this stuff should run, it is not, uh, running like that because this is asynchronous logic and our fetch takes time our initiated prints out before we get a response um, and before we parse the json and if we look in our browser we can see there's that initial promise this line printing out here's our fetch initiated this line printing out and then we start getting our asynchronous logic kicking in after a few seconds when the fetch has finished talking to that server so let me expand this first one. So we were looking at the response. We were printing out some information. We were seeing if we got a bad response from the server for some reason, uh, we threw an error, which stopped the chain. So this stops the chain of thens and kicks things over to the catch. So this through an error, if we ask um, for like some Pokemon that's not there, this will run and make sure that this then gets skipped and we end up being uh, caught and printing this out in our uh, console. So if I check it out, um, we can see the fetch is initiated, that response prints out. And then we are running our bad API request. So nothing tries to get inserted into the page. This whole function is skipped over. 
But if that's successful, so I go back to Butterfree, this runs, which returns a promise. So then the next uh, then in our chain waits for that promise to finish, gets the JSON, and all of this kicks off, which we learned how to sort of parse that JSON object, which had a lot of information in it in deeply nested paths. Um, so we parsed that out into local variables, and then we put that onto the page. There was a ton here. That's a lot of information to process. So I recommend going through this slowly um, and experimenting with trying to reach into different fields from your data, put some different stuff on the page, and just keep in mind in the back of your head, we didn't do this in a React project. So we are using some stuff that we don't do in React projects where we try and manipulate the inner HTML of an element. That is generally something you don't do in React projects because React handles the rendering for us. So just keep in mind as you're, you're sort of playing with that API that you're doing things just for this project. We're, we're just in regular JavaScript so that we can focus on the concepts and then bring them over to React later. So I'm going to leave things here, and the next time we revisit this, we are going to move this logic into React and see how to um, talk to a server in the context of a React project.